Hello everyone. Um, I'm Chris Hamlet. I'm National Outreach Officer for Material Science and Engineering and welcome to Coco Microbox Live. So um, in this session we will be going over um, live to Mark in Swansea um, in a few minutes um, for some wonderful live SEM. But um, before that I just want to give you a brief overview of what the Coco Microbox project is. It's a project that we at Discover Materials um, run over this summer with the, the Royal Society of Chemistry. So there was 60, um, the RSE um, funded 60 uh, boxes that we put together for year six um, students at schools in South Birmingham, and also 160 boxes to year seven um, students. So each of the students got their own box of awesome science kit, and also we um, put together a booklet for them to work through over the summer holidays. So and the, book, and the um, box contained all the equipment they would need to carry out these, um, uh, all these activities. Um, and you can actually download the um, booklet for free from our Padlet page. Um, so it's available to all, um, the booklet. So if you click on the, QR code here, it would take you to the Padlet page where you can um, view the booklet or download it. But I'll just quickly go through the booklet. So, so saying it, some collaboration between Discover Materials, um, the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Friends of Cottage Park, who um, are a focal point for the, was the local park for the two schools we were working with, which were Cottage um, Primary School and King's Dorton High School for Girls. So in the booklet, we were trying to um, instill and, and inspire year sixes and sevens into material science and how important chemistry is in material science. So the first bit was to send them on a material scavenger hunt. So there's, there was a clipboard and um, a scavenger hunt sheet that they could look at materials all around them. Um, work out and have a think about why that material was used. We then encourage them to think of what these materials are actually made from. So this might well be something Mark, Mark will touch on as crystals and stuff that things are made of. Um, and also we set them a challenge of making lovely bubble rafts to um, mimic, the, the, to model uh, atomic packing in metals. And this led us then to talk about bubbles and give them some hands-on um, demonstrations of making their own bubbles, making um, gases from various reactions, and also how to stabilise them using surfactants. But also we encourage them to use their very own science kit to, uh, to carry out their own investigations. So we, in the kit, we included a little booklet. Um, so it's their very own lab book. Um, Yep, so they can then go and think of wonderful science um, questions of their own. So as I say, um, you can download a copy of this um, book because it's absolutely free from our Padlet page. Um, and um, during this session, I'll put up the link to the Padlet page as well. But also to back up the boxes, we've um, had two live sessions in Cottage Park um, over the summer holidays and we had over 250 people coming to the two sessions we ran, um, in which we showcased some of the activities in the booklet. So over to the right hand side, we were looking at water repellent surfaces, um, and also at the bottom, and also we were um, making um, bubbles using a, back, um, a nine volt battery, water and a little bit of bicarbonate of soda. Um, but also one of the stars of the book box was undoubtedly the clip-on microscope lens, as you can see here in the bottom left, which opened up the world of the small to the, the um, box holders. And then this links on to our session today. So I'm going to pass over to Mark now in Swansea, where we're going to look at the world of very small through his microscope. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hopefully you can all see me. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, welcome to Swansea University, uh, live streaming from um, a scanning electron microscope room. Um, and this is one of the 
the, the microscopy labs that I use as a scientist and as an engineer to look at all of the internal structures right down to the microscopic level of all the materials that I work with on a weekly basis. So you're going to be joining me today for a little exploration of all the different structures of some materials that I have for you. So um, this is what we're going to be using today. This is what an, a scanning electron microscope looks like. And uh, inside this microscope, I've got um, about 15 samples, and they're going to be ranging from metals, polymers, even some bugs and creepy crawlies. OK, um, and so I'm going to be showing you lots of different structures. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the science behind those structures and what they mean for the properties of materials. So I've got some slides to show you, first of all, just to frame out the session. So bear with me a second. And then what we'll talk about a little bit is why we should care about the structures of these materials um, and how they link to the properties of them. So if I can share my slides to start with. And then Chris could give me a thumbs up if he can see the slides, if that's OK. Brilliant. So, um, yeah, so welcome to Swansea University. Um, we're going to be running about a 40 minute session now looking at um, uh, different materials under the microscope. And um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, so that's me. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer here at Swansea University, and I teach uh, materials science and engineering to first year engineering students. And um, I teach a lot of students, actually. Um, I teach a lot of other engineering, engineering disciplines. So I teach mechanical and aerospace, medical and materials engineering students. And that's because all of the material that they use, all of the components that they use have to be made from something. And so they all have to have an understanding of the structure and properties of their materials. And so that's essentially what the definition of material science and engineering is. It's the understanding here of the link between the structure of a material, which we look at today using my microscope, and how that affects the properties. So if we didn't know what a materials engineer is um, now you do and um, when we talk about the structure of materials the structure can depend on the scale of which we're describing so you can have the structure of a bridge right the structure of a house i can see in the lab here i've got door frames i've got ceiling panels walls window frames glass a concrete floor and so the building itself has a structure and so does like an engine right it's got moving components and so the structure depends on the size of which we're talking about. Um, in labs like this, um, we actually need microscopes to look at smaller and smaller structures. And you couldn't look at the structure of different types of materials with the lenses that Chris was just talking about there, the little clip on lenses. You can even zoom in pretty well with your camera phone these days. Um, if you're in school, um, don't be afraid to put some different types of materials under your biology lab microscopes. If you've got uh, biology microscopes in your school and you normally put sort of um, slides under there with maybe some blood or tissue samples, then you can put different materials under there as well. But today we're going to get down almost to the atomic structure, okay? And we're going to look at how atoms affect the properties of materials, which leads us on to the different types of properties we can be interested in. And when we talk about structural properties, how hard or soft something is, that comes under mechanical properties. But you can see here as I'm clicking away, there's lots of different ones, okay? So how resistant something is to chemical attack, um, how likely is it to corrode? These all depend on the internal structures of the material. Okay, so let's talk about scale then and how zoomed in are we going to go today? And I thought I'd put together this little schematic. Um, the human eye, at a reasonable distance, depending on how old you are, of course, uh, can kind of zoom in about half a millimeter, maybe a bit less. So if you had like a ruler from school or a general sort of tape measure, you could look and you could see about half a millimeter relatively easily day to day. If you wanted to zoom in a little bit more, then you'd need a magnifying glass. And that would, if this was half a millimeter long, this light blue line here, 
then about a fifth of that for a magnifying glass, if it was times five magnification, that would take you down to about this level. And a light microscope, then you start to get really small straight away. So you can use light microscope down to about 0.5 microns, which is about 500 nanometers, right? So if this is what your human eye could see, and then if this line is what you can see with a magnifying glass, then this is what you can see with a light microscope. And this lower value here is fixed. We can't really go any lower than this. Even if we had really gigantic glass lenses and we had lots and lots and lots of them, we can't really go much lower because we're limited by the actual size of light, believe it or not. Okay, the wavelength of light um, is limited. If we're using light to look at something, um, that's that's how uh, that that determines the resolution of how much we can zoom in. And so we need to use something else. We need to use something different. Oh no! So am I still? Have I been kicked off? Oh dear. Well, we need to use something else. Okay, and for that reason, we need to use um, a light microscope. And so, uh, sorry, an electron microscope. So hopefully now you can see my uh, electron screen. Chris, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the SEM screen? Brilliant. And so this is what um, an, an electron microscope can do. Um, instead of using light, we can use an electron. And there's two really cool things about electrons. One is they're really small. And two, they're negatively charged. And so we can control them. And so that's what this microscope does. Um, we've got an electron source at the top here, and we're firing it down here at about 20,000 volts, by the way, okay? And then we're using that beam to scan across our sample. And because electrons are very, very small, um, we can focus that beam and we can get really good resolution from our material. So this is our first example today. Um, I don't know whether anybody watching now has been to Swansea University before. It is a bay campus that we have uh, the engineering campus and we're right close to the beach and that might give you a little bit of a clue as to what this material is. And so just to give you an idea of the scale at which we're working at here, I can zoom in on something like this. Move around a little bit. I'll slow the scan speed down. And you can see it's kind of like, I don't know, a little boulder or a little kind of rock about that size. And it's only when I start to zoom out that maybe you can see what this might be in the microscope. There's lots of them. They're all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are relatively smooth. Some of them are a bit angular. And you might have guessed it, this is sand. This is sand from Swansea Beach, Swansea Bay Beach. And we can analyze the sand, we can look at it, we can see the different shapes. This is actually pretty good sand. Um, if you wanted to use this as a construction material, um, this fairly uniform in size. Um, it doesn't have that many shells in it. Um, if you looked at sand from other beaches from across the world, they would look very, very different. Okay, so if you had volcanic ash, uh, of volcanic sandy beaches, they would look fantastic. Um, and if you had more uh, rocky or stony beaches, they would have more pebbles in them as well. And other beaches would be a mix maybe of more shell-like material. And there's an example of that up here. You can see this is actually glowing a little bit more. This is slightly brighter. And if I bump the contrast up a bit as well, as we're scanning, then potentially this could be also a shell. And essentially that's what sand is, right? It's a mixture of rocky materials that's been pounded and ground away by um, the action of the waves. And basically dead fish and dead creatures and shells and all sorts of other things that have washed up on the beach. And so we're going to stick with that kind of nautical theme. I've got a few other samples here on my uh, sample tray. And I'm going to move around 
And this next one is our first example today of a biomaterial. So I'm going to just double click off screen. My SEM, you might be able to hear it whirring away in the distance, is able to drive then to a predetermined spot. And then we can look at our sample. So I need to do a little bit of focusing, just as you would like a normal camera phone or um, a light microscope. You still got to focus your microscope. But then we can see this really strange layered material. Very, very cool. So I'll zoom in a little bit. And then you can see potentially between the layers. I might change the way we look at this a second to a different type of detector. Let's see if this looks slightly better. Ah, there we go. Much better. Here we go. So this is a slightly different material. This was once alive. Um, this was something that a friend of mine was doing her research project on at Swansea University, and she was collecting these from the beach. And you might see these washing up from time to time. Um, this is cuttlefish bone. And if you've got birds or parrots at home, the, you can actually see these in the cage as well, because birds and parrots like to nibble on these and sharpen and clean their beaks. The cool thing about cuttlefish bone is it has this kind of layered internal structure. Um, whether it looks like, I don't know, a, a block of flats or some kind of um, sort of bookshelves, okay, with each shelf being these banded layers here with kind of books stacking in between. And the cool thing about this material is, well, first of all, it's a biomaterial, right? So this, this hasn't been engineered in any way, apart from obviously by the cuttlefish. But also, the reason why uh, Laura was looking at this material is because it has a really cool property. Um, when this cuttlefish um, gets impacted on the outside, the each layer will break, but it breaks on its own. So each layer will fail. And then as the, the load is kept on increasing, the, each layer will fail sequentially. So Laura tested this. Um, inside an x-ray CT machine. And she was able to watch how this bone gets crushed. Obviously, the, the animal was dead right before she did this. Otherwise, that'd be really mean. Um, but this, this, this cool effect then meant that the sort of internal structure or the bottom part of the cuttlefish was very well protected. Because if I keep on zooming out here, you can see that there's quite a lot of layers, right? And so if you wanted to really damage the internal um, areas of this cuttlefish, you would have to fail through each one of these layers sequentially. And we see this in the world of engineering. We see this. Uh, we see this from cardboard boxes. And if you actually look at a cardboard box, the cool thing about it is you can see this kind of approach. Um, you would have two layers. And normally, in between the two layers, you have a zigzag of, of cardboard or paper as well. And so that layer is designed to, to crush, to compress, and spring back if, if it's loaded, and then not damage the inside of um, or, or, well, whatever you've had for, for your delivery. Okay, And so stuntmen use this. This is the type of setup that you'd see in a film where you'd have loads and loads of cardboard boxes and normally they throw a big sort of plastic sheet over it. And then when the, the stunt person goes off the top of the building ah, and they crash down into the cardboard boxes, their impact gets absorbed and they're very, very safe. And so that all that can be seen here just by looking um, at the structure of cuttlefish. How cool is that? So we'll stay with the sort of um, biomaterials. Um, and again, we'll stay with stuff from the beach. So I'm going to move to a new area. And I'm going to try a different detector. I'll go back to the variable pressure detector. Here we go. And these might not look like anything special. Um, they just kind of look like little shells. But what you've got to remember is the scale. And these were found in the sand at Swansea Beach. 
And these are little crustaceans and little shells and little creatures that you find in the sand. And you find these all the time, these little sand dollars. If you could, uh, next time you're on the beach, if you were to sort of really look at the, the sand, you might be able to pick out um, one or two of these little um, creatures. The cool thing about these as you zoom in is, again, they have structure, okay? Um, and you can't really see that structure until you zoom in uh, with microscopes like this. So here's my first one, I quite like this one. It's very, relatively circular, so there would have been some kind of creature living in here, some kind of maybe little crustacean, little crab. Um, and you can actually see as you zoom in and you continue to zoom in, how that shell has grown. Um, it's actually quite porous in places. So can you see these little holes? Um, and that allows the, the creature to filter the seawater through to the shell um, and then protect itself at the same time. But my favorite one, I think I'll zoom back out. My favorite one is uh, this one down here to the bottom right. This one here. And the reason why I like this one is um, it's because you can relate to it. Uh, if you've ever gone to the beach and you've seen a really nice um, seashell like this, and you kind of hold it up to your ears you, when you were younger and say, oh, you know, I can hear the sea. Um, really, really pretty. Obviously, there used to be a little crab that used to live in there. But the cool thing about these types of materials and these types of structures is they also have an internal swirling structure. And um, that's very, very efficient. Um, for letting, again, water to filter through the shell. And so engineers are starting to look at these types of structures and really understand how water and fluid moves through these shells. And a lot of research is going in now to try to understand how we can harness that type of structure to use for underwater um, electricity generation, for example, where we have underwater turbines, either in dams or for tidal generation. And all that can come from just analyzing the structure of these really, really small shells. Okay, so we'll stick with the bio theme for now, but we'll move away from the beach and we'll come slightly more inland. And this is probably one of my, um, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see, this is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, I'll speed up the scan rate a little bit. So this is a moth. And as you can see, this moth is very hairy. Um, laying on its back, definitely needs a haircut um, before it goes back to school this semester. Um, and again, we look at these types of um, bugs, these types of biomaterials. Um, and we think to ourselves as engineers, well, what can we learn? And let's try a different detector, see if we can get a nicer image. Oh, maybe not, maybe the first one was nicer. Now, I'm not just talking about the, the structure or the the sort of hairiness of the moth, although that is quite interesting. If you look at the wing structure, um, you can see that the, the hairs there are designed to sort of uh, catch the wind and make it much easier to fly. The, ring, the thing that really sort of interests me is the eye of the moth. And you see this in other types of bugs. You can see this in um, ladybirds, uh, caterpillars. They have something called a compound eye. And that works slightly differently to the human eye where we have all our um, sort of receivers, if you like, of light, okay, our sensors are inside our eyeball towards the back, okay, so you might have your, your retina right at the back, that's the bit that's sensitive to light, but that's inside of our eyeball. The difference between us and bugs like this is that all of their sensors are on the outside of their eyeball, and in fact their eye is made up of a series of sensors kind of on the outside of their body. And that's kind of the theme with bugs in, in general, okay? They, they, their skeleton of a bug is actually on its outside, okay? You look at 
something uh, something called an exoskeleton. If you actually look at an ant or a ladybug or a wood louse, it's like a tank, right? It's It's got armor plates and we'll have a look at one in a second. That's because its skeleton is on the outside. And you might have seen bugs, you know, on the weekend, as Chris was saying, you were going on your sort of uh, materials treasure hunt, but you might not have stopped to think about maybe looking at the structure of some of the bugs. Okay. Um, and so hopefully you can see if I zoom in, there you go, you can start to see the structure of the eye itself. This is a really, really nice example, really clean. Um, not much pollen on this one or dust, a little bit maybe. But this type of strategy then um, is actually again used in science uh, and it's used in satellites. So if you look at things like um, the Hubble telescope or some of the really deep space um, radars um, and, and, and satellites that are orbiting the planet, they're not just made up of one sensor or one mirror. They're made up of lots and lots of different mirrors. And those, each of those mirrors can be sort of angled slightly and they can focus and tweak and, and calibrate themselves to get the really nice pictures that you see, um, like all the nebulas and stars being uh, born and, and exploding and everything. And they have a similar structure to this in that they're each of them made up of different segments, normally hexagons. And this brings me nicely on to the next part of today's show. Um, if we looked at a zoomed in picture of these, these eyes. We can focus this nicely for you all. You can tell it's a live stream. I'm having to work quite hard to get the microscope to behave itself this morning. Here we go. You can see it's made up of these really um, regular um, hexagonal shapes. So each one of these is a sensor and uh, they're packed in really, really nicely. You can see um, there's no gaps in between. Um, each of these hexagons are six-sided. Um, and we see this quite a lot actually in nature. And you can maybe have a guess at where we might see this type of honeycomb structure. Okay, there's a little guess there for you, a little clue. Um, yeah, we, we see this in sort of bees nests and wasps nests um, where the larva are stacked in this kind of these little hexagonal chambers or they fill them up with honey or whatever okay and the reason why this structure is seen all the time in um, in nature is because it's very efficient you can pack quite a lot of material into a small space like this and it means you don't have to um, invest a lot in making the outside of the, like the boxes or the little hexagons to store your baby wasps, right? Or baby bees. Um, and we see this as well in materials science and engineering. So we also see this in the atomic structures of materials. And I'm gonna switch now to um, a more of a live view. There we go. And so hopefully you can see me now on the webcam. I can see myself. Um, we talk about structures like this in material science and engineering. And when you have a crystal structure like this, um, the atoms are packed in certain shapes. Now this isn't a hexagonal shape. And this is something called monoclinic. You can have like cubic structures, um, hexagonal structures like we've just seen. We can have really funky stretched one, like this is kind of stretched in one direction. And then it's got this like um, sort of parallelogram in the other direction. And what that means then is the atoms are all packed in in a certain way, in a certain direction. Okay, um, so what does that mean for materials? Well, metals, for example, they have this way of packing. So if you've done any sort of metallic bonded type of ideas in GCSE chemistry, for example, you'll understand that the atoms in a metal are all arranged like they were in um, like this, okay, in the, the, the eye. And um, you have a sea of electrons kind of binding it all together. But one block of metal isn't made up of one block then of atoms all the same way. And I'll come back to that in a second, right? So let's go back to the SEM. And 
let's move on to our next sample because this is going to really help us out. Now you might, have, I'm pretty sure you'd have seen this um, on your treasure hunt. Maybe you went, you got really excited. You went straight out on the weekend, like Chris was saying, and you had to look at some materials and had to find what was in your garden, maybe. I bet most of you didn't think to start looking in the kitchen. And the kitchen is actually a really fun place to find some really cool materials. And one of my favorite materials to look at from the kitchen, uh, let me just kind of play around a little bit here, here it comes, is this. Now I'll zoom out slightly, zoom out a bit more. And those of you that are looking might be able to guess now what this material is as I keep on zooming out. So these are crystals. These are little crystals. Now, no, I'm not rich. I don't just randomly keep lots of crystal laying around my house, okay? Uh, but, but I kind of do, all right? I've got literally hundreds of thousands of crystals in my kitchen, maybe even millions. Um, these are grains of sugar, okay? And little grains of sugar like this, if you kind of look at them again with your little microscope or um, with your camera phone, you can see that each individual uh, sugar grain is its own crystal. And we, we can sort of flick back and forth between that terminology, right? A grain and a crystal, they kind of mean the same thing. Um, and so if you looked at sugar, you would see all these grains, all these little crystals, and you can see the shape of the crystals as well. You can see sometimes the crystals kind of maybe dissolve a little bit and like have um, like grown into each other. Let me see if I can try and find one on its own. Maybe you can spot one on the screen. Um, here we go. So there's a clump there, but then there's a nice one on its own here. Okay, Mark. So yeah, sugar under a microscope looks looks really pretty, really cool. You get these cool sort of blocky cubic like crystals, really nice structures. And some of these are quite funky then when you have them sort of growing into each other. Uh, but how does that relate again to materials and properties? Well, metals do this. Okay, metals, believe it or not, have a very similar structure to sugar. Uh, I'm not suggesting you put you know, flakes of metal in your tea to make it, you know, taste any sweeter. What I mean is that the atomic structure of metals form crystals just like the sugar does. So they form this regular repeating pattern of really ni nicely packed atoms, um, but they don't do it for the whole block of metal, don't forget. So what you can have in metals then is essentially these grains or these crystals all joining up to form one block of metal. And I've got another example here to show you. And you might have seen this. So if you'd gone and looked at an old dustbin or a lamppost out in the end of the street, or next time you're in the car, have a look at the sort of central reservation of the motorway, you might be able to see galvanized materials, which means that the grains or the crystals are big enough that you can see them without the need for a microscope like this with the naked eye. And so you can actually, hopefully you can see that on the camera, you get something like this. And this is um, a galvanized piece of sheet steel. And the grains on this are actually really, really big. So, I mean, what some of these are like bigger than my thumb, right? So about two or three centimeters in size, really, really large. And the cool thing about this type of demonstration is it shows you this isn't made up of one crystal, okay? Don't get me wrong, you can actually on purpose create a piece of metal that is grown from a seed crystal very, very slowly, very controlled, and you can grow just like a plant um, from a seed crystal uh, component that has all of the atoms arranged in one direction, and is made from one single crystal. And in fact, we do that in a jet engine turbine blade component. And so the next time you're on um, an aircraft going somewhere, the inside the engine, there will be um, components grown from a seed crystal uh, and they will be a single crystal. 
This isn't a single crystal. This is a polycrystalline material. You can see there's lots of different grains and crystals there. But can you see, as I'm kind of moving it on the webcam, can you see that like they change color slightly and some of the grains look bright one minute and then they kind of go dark, but then they come back bright and they all have slightly different gray values. And that gives you a clue as to the structure of the materials. It's because um, each crystal is orientated slightly differently. Okay. Just like we saw on the sugar, some of these have joined together. One just happened to grow one direction, the other grew the other direction, and they kind of met and blurred and formed a, a boundary between the two. And so on our um, example here, when you have the different colors, the different gray values, it means the atomic structure of some of these grains are orientated in different directions. So for example, see this kind of, um, let me see if I can see that little top, big top one up there, the, the gray one, that might mean all the atoms are arranged in this direction. But that this one over here, the lighter one, it might mean the atoms are all arranged in this direction. Okay. And so they catch the light differently, just like a filter on the light. Okay. And that's why then they look slightly different colors. Now, as material scientists and engineers, we have the power to choose some of these crystals, pick them out, and like I said, um, grow them from a seed and um, have a certain direction to some of these crystals. And those directions do actually change then how these metals behave in their properties. So things like magnetic properties and electrical conductivity are really, really affected by how these crystals are orientated. So you can see now straight away with all the electrification of transport that's happening, how something like this is really, really important and really interesting and worth researching, yeah? Okay, let's get back to the microscope. And we'll move on to our um, last few samples because um, it was quite hard to visualize this. This is quite a thin sort of sheet of steel. In reality, a, a block of metal, um, is actually closer to what Chris was describing at the start of the video. It's more like a set of bubbles. And so I've tried to find a sample that kind of will give you that idea. So let's see if this works. Uh, and let's see if you can guess what it is whilst you're watching the video. Um, now you can't really put like soap bubbles inside of an electron microscope, okay? Um, because to use the electrons, uh, what we have to do is pump out most of the air from inside here. Uh, and so if you had bubbles, they would burst. Uh, but this kind of looks like uh, the structure you would get from bubbles. And so this is actually a really good example of what you get in the bulk of a metal or a crystal structure. So what I want you to imagine, these uh, bubbles have burst. I'll show you what this is in a second. But I want you to imagine that each one of these areas is a crystal and that these lines here are the boundaries between the crystals. And that's exactly what you would get in um, a polycrystalline material in three dimensions. Now, this isn't technically a polycrystalline material. It's just representing its structure. Um, some of you may have guessed this bubble-like material. But if you can see, there's a good um, clue here. A lot of these bubbles have burst and these kind of bubbles are all interconnected. So if you were to fill this up with water, for example, um, the bubbles would soak them up. But then if you were to squeeze it, all the water would come out because these bubbles have holes in them, okay? Or they're all connected and the water would find its way out. And so that kind of gives you a clue as to what this material is. Uh, it's actually made predominantly from a polymer uh, and they're made in this bubble-like structure. And some of you may have guessed it, you might have seen it off camera here, it's a squidgy, okay? It's just from the kitchen and I've pinched a little bit here and I popped it on there and that's what you get inside the squidgy um, itself, okay? So it's made from a polymer, um, so the, it's quite springy but the bubbles themselves are all interconnected and kind of burst open. Now that's different to the structure you would get in something like 
um, a foam that's used for insulation, okay? That's different in that each of those bubbles normally are sealed. And what we want to do then is that creates an air barrier because air is very, very, is a very, very good insulator. So when you have um, foam, okay, as insulation or you have uh, insulation in your attic, what you're trying to do is trap the air, okay, and it's the air that actually insulates your house. Just like the air in our atmosphere insulates us from the coldness of space, okay. And again, you can see that structure in the microscope. Okay, so I've got about five or 10 minutes left. So we're gonna move on to one, a last demonstration. And this is something that Chris has sent me in the post. So thank you very much, Chris. This is, again, a biomaterial, um, which was once alive, of course. And this is a leaf. And this is a lotus leaf and lotus leaves themselves are actually quite large, right? So this is only a very small section of a lotus leaf inside my microscope. So the lotus leaf itself has a really cool property. And I'll leave it like that for now. I'll show you the demo and then I'll zoom in and show you why, okay? So some of you with really good eyesight might see that um, the lotus leaf's got these little dots on. Um, and it's also got some texture in between the dots. And the lotus leaf has a really cool trick. Um, lotus leaves themselves don't like water. Okay, they're hydrophobic. And so if you were to pour water onto a lotus leaf, it beads and then it runs off. Okay, and I'll try and do this again in, in a lab with a quarter of a million pound piece of equipment and I'll try not to break it. I got told off last time but I'll have another go anyway. So this is a part of a lotus leaf. Oh it's gone a bit crispy now and a bit dry. The leaves themselves are actually really big so they kind of fan out. So this is like I got about three sections left. So I don't know Chris how big a sort of lotus leaf would be how many sections. I mean, much bigger than a big serving dinner plate or something. I don't know how you would describe that, but really, really big. And lots of surface, okay, which they can, if, if you have water beading on a, on a surface of a leaf, um, they can actually end up burning that region. And so um, the lotus leaf has designed this structure to create, uh, to let water bead up and then run off it so it doesn't pool on the leaf. And it also helps to clean the leaf as well. So. Here we go. Make sure I've got nothing like plugged in around my feet. So I'll try and get this to bead onto. There we go. Can you see it kind of dancing around? It's not really sticking. And that's quite a lot. That's a big blob of water. I'm going to get shouted at again in the lab. OK, but it, can you see it's not leaving um, any wetness underneath where it's rolling? And if I was to just tip this sideways now, the wind which is kind of blow all that off whoop, onto the floor of the lab and the leaf itself is completely dry. Okay, I have one more go because I, I think it's really cool. Can you see it forms these lovely little perfect bees of water and the water itself doesn't cling to the, the leaf. Um, but if there was any bugs or any dirt or there, that little bit of water would just clean all that leaf off nicely and then because the wind would come right and that bead of water would just run off. So why is that interesting? Why is that important? Well, you might have seen in some of the YouTube videos where people, um, you can coat now, there's been some development for materials that you can coat different materials with this kind of hydro hydrophobic coating. And then um, essentially then it's really, really hard for you to get muddy or dirty or mucky. And so you might have seen some of these YouTube videos where you've got somebody sort of standing there in a shirt like what I'm wearing, a normal shirt, and then somebody else wearing a lab coat or something with this kind of special material coated onto it. And they throw a big bucket of muddy water over them. One person gets really, really drenched and horrible and muddy. And the other person, it just kind of runs off them just like the water off the leaf. And so that would be one use for this type of material. So let's have a look under the microscope and see why water beads like it did. And it's actually down to the structure of the material itself and the size and the spacing of the 
the surface of the leaf. And so if the leaf was very flat, um, like a glass or a knife or a kitchen worktop, then it would be, it would form um, uh, a sort of bond, if you like, it would stick to the surface. But the lotus leaf itself, under the microscope, first of all, it's got these kind of, I'd say, medium sized um, dimples. And then as you keep on zooming and zooming and zooming in, you can see it's got these even smaller ones and they're quite regularly spaced around. I mean, they're not sort of packed in like what we saw earlier with the crystal structures where the hexagonal um, eyes were really, really packed in, but they cover the majority of the surface of the leaf. And it's actually these little raised um, structures that stop the bead of water from actually sticking to the leaf itself. And so at no point does the water bead uh, make contact with the leaf. It kind of sits on top of these little um, raised dimples and floats around from region to region. Okay, um, so we're gonna finish off with some more traditional materials now, some more metallic samples. And this is something that um, I predominantly work on now is the metal side rather than the biomaterial side. And you might be able to see it on the screen here, all the different materials that I have inside the microscope. So let's, um, let's drive over to this material, this sample here. So on the right hand side, here, you can see it coming into frame now. I've got these different columns of materials. And these have been tested at Swansea and they've been pulled apart. So remember, all everything that we've done today, uh, all the structures that we've looked at, are all, um, we're, we're also interested in looking at how those structures affect the properties of these materials. And so what we normally do is we'll get something, we'll break it, okay? We'll measure how much force we need to break something. And then we look at the internal structure and see how it broke and even sometimes where it started to break from. So I'll try and do that for this material. Okay, maybe I'll change the way we look at this material. Let's have a look. Oh, that's very bright, isn't it? Maybe not. Let's go back to the variable pressure SE. There we go. So this type of material um, is a metal and uh, it's been tested and it's been pulled apart basically. Um, and it's broken, okay? So what we're looking at here is the crack surface or the fracture surface where it's actually fractured and broken and cracked. And um, you might be able to see um, a few different things. This, first of all, is another little crack there. But can you see this little crescent shape? Okay, on the left hand side here. Um, that's because there was a, a pre existing uh, flaw on the edge of this material where it was machined. And then this region here cracked first. And then the rest of this cracked. It kind of looks like. A crescent moon, I don't know, like a, yeah, like a, like a moon ship. But that's very different. And also, if you look at um, the outside of the sample, can you see it's still quite circular? And it's kind of the same width as what it was um, before it was, uh, before it was split into two. Now that's different to um, a ductile material. So this is, this would be called this um, a brittle failure but that's different to a ductile failure. So if I move on to uh, my second metal sample, this is gonna look very different. And um, here it is. Now, the first thing you might see is that the sample itself looks a bit smaller. Can you see this smaller circular shape here? This is how big um, the sample originally was. Let me zoom in and get this into focus.
And so what's happened here is this sample, when it's been pulled and stretched apart, it's gotten thinner and thinner and thinner before it's failed. And that is more classic of a, something called a ductile failure. Now that's different to the one we, we first saw um, in that that was almost like a crack, yes? And the sample surface was quite flat and the actual part itself didn't thin out at all. It was the same dimensions as what it started. Now that's a bit more dangerous because you don't really have any warning, okay? The sample is kind of, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, and then snap. It's cracked and as soon as it's cracked, it's broken. Now that's slightly different to a, a ductile failure in that a ductile material will start to bend and warp out of shape before it actually pulls itself apart. And so you get a little bit more warning in terms of the engineering world to pick up something like this maybe under inspection, okay? Because you might see something's bent or um, I don't know, like a door might not close properly because something's warped and you might pick it up. Um, and the word I used just now was pulled itself apart. And you can even see that right down at the sort of microscopic level. So you get something in a ductile material called ductile voids. And this is gonna bring us full circle in a second because it looks very spongy. Um, if you think back to a sort of spongy material, um, a material full of holes, um, in a material like this, uh, we call these voids, we call these ductile voids. And it is literally holes appearing in the material because it's being pulled apart from the inside out. And so this is one of those sort of telltale signs, if you like, when you're looking at a fracture surface, when you see a structure like this, you can realize that this is probably bent or warped out of shape and then has pulled itself apart before it failed. So this is an example of a ductile failure. I just want to show you maybe one more material if we've got time. The last one, which is a kind of a nice example, brings us back to our sort of biomaterial roots. This is an example of wood. Um, and the wood is a really nice uh, composite material, if you like. Um, this, I think this is plywood. This is a cross section of plywood. It's quite hard to get in focus because it's all different layers. Oh, is it, gonna, am I gonna be able to get it in time? Maybe not. Quite tricky to see. There we go. So we've got different layers here. So this, this is an example of plywood. So if you think about um, back to what we were describing earlier, where we have um, structures of materials, wood is a really nice example of that type of uh, material that has uh, a structure, but it has more of a structure in one direction. So if you think about the grain in wood, um, wood is definitely stronger in one direction uh, compared to another direction. So if the grain is running one way, it would be much stiffer in that direction uh, and much easier to break in the other direction. So for example, if you had um, a piece of firewood and you wanted to split it, if you get the ax and you split it down the grain of the wood, then it would just split really easily. But if you had the grain of the wood sideways and you tried to split it with the ax, you'd have to give it a couple of whacks before you get it to go. And so the reason why plywood is really strong is because plywood um, uses that directionality of wood in each layer. But what it does instead is it builds those layers up and then it puts different directions of grain for each layer. So rather than being strong in one direction, plywood is strong in all directions, which is why as a big sheet material, you can use it to build walls and floors and houses and all the rest of it. So that brings us back kind of full circle. My time is up. I am, I'm gonna leave you with um, one more quick guess before we finish. I'm gonna take you back to the beach at Swansea. 
back to a bio material. Oh, we didn't get a chance to look at um, the last bug. This is quite a nice one. Um, even though this is a bio material, it didn't come from the sea, but it certainly spends a lot of its time out at sea. It's a very, very fine structure and it has different levels uh, of scale. So first of all, you can see this is kind of the spine, almost like a hair, half a millimeter or so. Then it has a thinner hair that comes off that. Quite stiff hair, by the way. And then even between these again, it has even thinner structures coming off those. So if I can zoom in quickly, maybe change the detector as it's charging a little bit. This is actually what a feather looks like. Okay, so if some of you were trying to guess, um, this is the internal structure of a feather. Okay, it's just sequentially smaller and smaller uh, stiff hairs all lined up neatly. So when you see a bird um, cleaning itself, what they're doing is they're straightening out their feathers and they're cleaning out all the sort of dust and any bits and bobs that get trapped in between all their furs and hairs that make up their feathers. So that would bring me to the end of the session. And I'm just going to remind us all, um, if I can log back into my slides, the kind of um, scale at which we've been working at today. Because I didn't have a chance to show you the last slide. Here we go. So this is where we've been today. We started with our human eye at about half a millimeter. You can use a magnifying glass, which you might have at home laying around. Um, and the light microscopes we've seen, we can get down to about half a micron. And if I share my last screen, we've been here. And then this is what we've been using today. We've been using an electron microscope. So if this is what you can see in school in your biology microscope. If that little tiny line there was this big, this is how far you can really zoom in with one of these microscopes. Okay, the one we have next door can actually spot how much your fingernail grows every second. Okay, that's the scale at which we're working at. But little changes, as you've seen today, with the structure of those um, crystals or the way those structures are made, they can have a big, big influence on how that material behaves and then how we can use that material as scientists and as engineers. So um, thanks very much for listening. I'm going to hand back to Chris. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic and just fast, amazing what you can see using uh, one of those scanning electron microscopes as well. But the one thing I think you showed brilliantly was the fact that using these microscopes, we can understand how materials are put together, whereas it, um, when you sort of think about metals and how those atoms are arranged to make crystals, but also how nature has um, has taken that step further to make functional yeah because yeah because nature's been nature's been doing this sort of trial and error thing right for thousands and thousands of years so mm. it makes sense for us to come in and really learn from what nature's been doing and because you know it's found these really efficient ways of solving these complex problems and so it saves us you know a lot of research uh if we can borrow from mother nature and learn from them and so um when i start to look at some of these structures uh, and the way they put together um i find it really really interesting and quite elegant as well some of these solutions yeah so some of the things you can see under the microscope are, are incredible and especially sort of how things actually break as well 
which I thought yeah, was so, so part, one of my one of my um, main research tasks at the moment is uh, I showed you just now we had those last couple of samples. They were little rods of metal and we sort of pull them apart and we measure their properties. And so we do that quite a lot with this instrument. Um, but the, the challenge then is normally you would look at the, the broken fracture surface and then you have to look at clues like I was showing you just now where you would have maybe those voids in there or you'd have some cracks or maybe some discoloration. And then you'd kind of have to work out, well, why did this break and, and how did it break and where did the crack initiate? One of the cool things that I'm working on at the moment is taking one of our really big um, te tensile testing frames, which is about the size of a, a door frame, and miniaturizing it and actually popping it inside this chamber and then doing my little test, but then actually watching how a crack grows or how a material can fail um, while it's failing. So instead of, wow. um, instead of coming to the scene of a crime, like a detective and trying to work out what's happening, it's more like actually being there and watching it happen and learning at first hand. Oh, well, that sounds incredible. Just sort of like watching it unfold on the microscale. Yeah, and because you can stop it and pause it and then take a picture and sort of, you know, learn about it and then 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 ask it to kind of go again. It's very tricky though. <laughs> very tricky to do. Oh, I bet. But no, I just think it also it's sort of just a shown great example of that how useful microscopes are just to learn about the wonderful materials we've got around us as well. I mean, it's people just, at home can do it straight away. So you you mentioned at the start, you know, you can get those little clip-on mm. microscopes now for uh, for your your you know your, your phone, right? And so even that, and going up and looking at your clothes, for example, that's a really great way of looking at um, the structure of your of your clothes. You can look at the structure of your skin. Um, you can look at all sorts of things around the house. I think the kitchen's a great place to start. Yeah. I think probably I think probably the kitchen's one of my favourite bits. Um, you know, if you've got a camera phone or you've got one of those little light microscopes and you know someone who has, you know, those nice kitchens, you have like a marble or like a stonework surface. If you really look closely at one of those, it kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like the, the crystal structures you get in, in metals. OK, it's made from stone or a ceramic material. But again, the principle is the same. These kind of polycrystalline um, grains all joined up. Yeah, because um, in the microbox as well, there was some samples of um, sugar and salt where, and little recrystallizing dishes where um, box recipients can try to recrystallize the, um, the sugar and salt and see how the crystal structure actually changes. So yeah, because you can amazing. grow these at home. Exactly, yeah. you can grow these at home. And so it's it's quite difficult to, I, I mentioned earlier, we can we can grow a metal, right? And, and we call, when we have a single crystal, nickel super alloy that we use in a jet engine turbine um, section yeah that's been grown from a seed crystal okay and so it's quite hard i think for people to understand that we've what we've done is we've 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 popped out one of these crystals from here my i don't know my favorite one i like i like this one because it's lined up in this direction and then we can get some molten metal like you would have at home say a really concentrated sugary or salty water and again, we can then control, if we control it really well, we can control how those atoms then sort of solidify back out onto our seed crystal. And then in a nice controlled way, we can grow our part as it cools down, much like people would grow a crystal at home in their kitchen. Oh, oh yeah, they just mentioned, is it nickel super alloy? What, what's the difference between a super alloy or an, an alloy? Okay, so a, sorry. Super, it's, it's, yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. So a super alloy, uh, nickels are, are quite strong me metals anyway, um, and they perform really well at high temperature. So if, if you're inside a jet engine, um, there's two things are going to be happening. One, you're going to be spinning around really, really quickly because it's an engine. Uh, and secondly, you're going to be uh, very hot. OK, so we're talking seven, eight, nine hundred degrees C, depending on what different part of the engine is. So that's what like five times hotter than your oven at home. Really, really hot. And so um, lots of materials are strong. That's fine. Um, but nickel is strong at high temperature, and that's the key bit. But nickel super alloys, they have special ingredients mixed into them. Um, so an alloy is 
kind of like when you make a cake, right? You need different ingredients. So, okay, flour might form the main part, but you need to add different things to it. So when the metal is molten, you would add different ingredients. And so it's not a pure material anymore. It's an alloy of different materials. And then when a nickel super alloy solidifies, it forms this really cool um, internal sort of scaffolding structure, which knits it together. And that internal, it's called a gamma prime um, scaffolding structure. You can see it in a microscope like this. That means that at high temperature, that material keeps its strength. Um, and so when it's spinning around inside your jet engine at high temperature, it's perfectly safe to use. Ah, well, it sounds really exciting <laughs> a bit of research that. So um, yeah, so. Yeah, just before we go, what um, sort of advice would you give sort of, um, key stage three and four school pupils if they want to pursue um, yeah. a career it's, it's in a good question, thing? Chris. Yeah, because I, um, when I was younger, sort of GCSE, and thinking about my GCSEs, I didn't really know about materials engineering. I hadn't really seen anything like this before, like a, a scanning electron microscope. And I, the only real time I'd look at looked at things, you know, under a microscope would maybe have been in biology, like GCSE biology, you know, when you have thin sheets of glass and you start to look at maybe you know cells from plants like this or the roots or maybe something i think do they still do um, cells from your cheek now and you can see and it wasn't until i came on an engineering summer school visit when i came to swansea and i saw all the other departments that i learned about material science and engineering and so i think one of the best bits of advice that i could give to um, gcse years is if you do have the chance to go to a science festival, like most people here know I've signed up for Coco Mad, right? Um, but if you get a chance to go to a British science festival or Swansea science festival or, or anything, any event that your school organizes or something local in the village, go to them, okay? Because chances are you'll meet somebody and you'll see something cool. And that's all they want to do is talk to people, just like I am today talking about my research talking about what I do from you know week to week um, and then if you get excited by it then you can learn more and then once you find out that you can study material science and engineering for example you can find out all the wonderful things about the courses and all the jobs that you can have when you finish so for my for my example when I was younger I wanted to be an astronaut I'm, I'm sure many young young boys and young engineers want to be astronauts right um, uh, I unfortunately I'm colorblind, right? So I can't fly a plane, so I'm not allowed to be an astronaut. But I'm proud to say that I've worked on materials that have gone into satellites in the European Space Agency. And so awesome. even though I've not been to space, I've worked on materials that have been to space. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. That sounds fantastic. So no, thank you very much. Um, for this wonderful insight into the, the tiny world of electron microscopy. And thank you for everyone for um, tuning in. It's been great. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.